Hello, Hidden Gems. Thank you so much for being here for our Saturday night live hidden hour with Dr. John Mathias, a licensed psychologist, and me, his wife and co-host, uh, a once TV reporter turned podcaster. We are your host tonight, and thank you to our many new subscribers since our Mormon Stories episode aired in Salt Lake City. I just got back into town last night. I missed you, babe. <laughs> it's good to see you again. Yeah, it was not a while. Yeah. It felt our, like a while. It, it was a while. Our family is now reunited. And for those that haven't seen that Mormon Stories episode, which revolves around the many LDS crimes we've been covering, um, or possible soon to be crimes from Jody Hildebrandt, Tim Ballard, and the Daybell case. We connected a few dots there, and you can watch that over on Mormon Stories or on Hidden True Crimes YouTube channel. It's two separate episodes. So uh, we are going to shift directions now. Uh, a big presser just came down when it comes to the Long Island uh, case as well as uh, also known as Lisk or uh, Rex Hewerman. John and I are going to work very hard again, as we always share, to not use certain words that uh, YouTube doesn't want us to use. And we are not trying to minimize the weight of Rex Hewerman's crimes. Uh, we are just trying to follow the standards that this uh, worldwide platform, YouTube, has uh has requested us to follow by not using certain words. Um, we also want to thank our many new Patreon members, patreon.com slash hidden true crime. Thank you so much for your support and for supporting us. We, we will be sh prioritizing the questions you have today. Let's set the stage. And, and for those that are new to this case too, please check out our playlist. We have been covering this case. We jumped off it for a time. We are back. We even have a powerful interview with Nikki Brass. She is someone who went on a date with Rex Hewerman. And so we are we are back. Please check out our playlist, uh, the Lisk Rex Hewerman playlist. Let's start tonight with a very big breaking presser. It was done with John Ray, the attorney for Shannon Gilbert, as well as he, he was accompanied by the Suffolk County police commissioner, Rodney Harrison, who uh, stood by uh, John Ray as he shared information from two very powerful new witnesses in the investigation. So I'm going to read from a cbsnews.com article about the presser. Uh, I will put a link to this article in the description of our, our video as well. So let's Excuse me. All right, here we go. New details about the Gilgo Beach murders were revealed Wednesday afternoon. John Ray, attorney for the victims, held a press conference at 3.15 p.m. in Miller Place. Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harris also attended. Harrison says they are interviewing four new people who, connect, who could connect more cases to suspect Rex Hewerman. Hewerman has been charged with murder in three of the Gilgo Beach murder cases, and he is the prime suspect in the fourth. But when it comes to Miss Karen Brigada, and when it comes to Miss Shannon Gilbert, they are the ones we are going to take a closer look at and see if they are connected to our defendant, Harrison said. So Harrison, again, is the police commissioner. Standing with John Ray, the attorney of Shannon Harris, police commissioner Harrison confirmed his office is interviewing four new potential witnesses who first came forward to John Ray and who has represented the family of sex worker Shannon Gilbert, who was discovered dead in 2010 near Gilgo. A cab driver signed an affidavit that she picked up Gilbert, who had been hiding in a motel bathroom as the man she now recognized, Hewerman, allegedly fled the scene. Suddenly, a giant man who fit the description of Rex Hewerman comes out and he's covering his face with his arm so he can't be seen and he runs to a van or an SUV right nearby that's parked right there. She continues to flash her lights and beep her horn and out comes a girl crying, shaking, visibly upset and gets in her car, Ray said. 
Another witness is in another sworn testimony said she and her boyfriend were swingers and they went to Hureman's home with sex worker, Karen Vergata. I'm going to, I'm going to correct that by the way, because in the presser, he actually stated that Karen Vergata was not a sex worker, but, uh, but a swinger. Isn't that right, John? Um, uh, I, 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 that. I, I've heard conflicting reports there, so I'm not okay. quite sure. Okay. I saw no. that. I saw some reporting that she was a sex worker, so I'm not, I'm not completely sure. No, I, be- okay. I believe she was because the, what I've read is that the, the couple that went over to Hewerman's house picked her up first. That's right. That's right. And the woman was a swinger, but the woman they picked up. Okay. You're right. So, but either way, uh, so, so Karen Vergata and I'll just, I'll just read the EBS news's article. They, they do their fact checking. So another witness in a storm testimony says she and her boyfriend were swingers and they went to Hewerman's home with a sex worker named Karen Vergata with Hewerman's wife taking part at times. So Asa Ellerup, she said this, this woman, um, who went to the Hewerman's home, she said that she would service Rex Hewerman over 20 times and that he was a serial user of sex workers. He would sometimes have them come two at a time to his house and his wife was home upstairs. Ray said she claims this woman claims that they left as a naked Karen Vergata allegedly playing swinging games with Hewerman stayed behind the four who have come forward in the serial killing case have no agenda. They said, we have a job here as law enforcement as Suffolk County police department to make sure we investigate every single complaint or interest in this case. And we make sure to look under every single stone to see if there are, there is any connection to Rex Hewerman, or if there is a connection to somebody else that may be involved with the bodies that were discovered on ocean parkway. Harrison said, Hewerman is jailed, charged with three murders and the prime spec suspect in the fourth of potentially others. The couple who identified themselves as swingers said that Hewerman's um, home was a known destination among swingers. The Suffolk County District Attorney responded to Wednesday's update saying, in part, any attorneys representing victims or their families by definition have a conflict of interest and should not be part of the investigation. Hewerman's attorney had no com- comment Wednesday. And again, that was CBS News. Uh, The headline, new witness in Long Island serial killer trial says victim left motel crying as Rex Hurman allegedly fled scene. Attorney. That's some heavy new development. (laughs) And some promising development, I want to say, for potential victims that uh, perhaps they will see justice as well. And I personally was most grateful to see that it wasn't just John Ray there, the attorney of Shannon Gilbert and Shannon Gilbert has, has always been a potential victim. Although, um, you know, that was, that's a frustrating story. Uh, and, um, for many who have watched what police have said about that. So if to have the Suffolk County police commissioner, Raymond, uh, Harrison, standing there with John Ray, I I was, that was really powerful to see. But what John Ray stated was really shocking, John. Yeah, for sure. So I think the, it raises a lot of questions that we didn't really talk about in our first show on Rex Hewerman. People have asked whether Asa has had much involvement, and now I think it kind of opens that door a little bit to what was her knowledge, what was her involvement. It seems as if she, number one, participated in some of the swinging activities that Rex was involved in, and number two, that some of those activities involved sex workers. So it's it's not inconceivable that some of those activities could have involved sex workers that ended up deceased later on. We don't know for sure. Um, and again, I mean, I'm, I'm speculating here, obviously, but I, you know, it's, it's, (laughs) we could go down a line of reasoning here that presents some potential problems for Asa. I, in terms of whether she was actually involved in the murders, 
I, you know, from what I understand, she wasn't around. She wasn't home when most of these killings occurred. But that's that's relevant to three victims. And there could be many victims, right, that they haven't completely, um, they haven't found sufficient evidence to charge Hewerman with additional victims. So I think there's certainly a lot of possibilities here that are still open. And I think at the very least, the question remains here. She knows about she knows about his dungeon, or I guess people have been calling it different things, but his right, his dungeon, his torture chamber, his sex room, whatever you want to call it. She she knew about that room. And now we know that she she knows about the sex workers, and now we know that she may have participated in some of those activities. So I'm not suggesting that she participated in the murders or killings at all, but uh, I think it, the bigger question is what did she know and when did she know it? And could she have done anything? Could she have made a call to police at some point um, expressing concerns, right? At the very least, you have this peculiar relationship where her husband is bringing home sex workers, as you said, two at a time occasionally. And she leaves town. And then all of a sudden sex workers disappear. Right? Like, I mean, does she not find that strange that's, that these sex workers are disappearing several miles from their house when she's out of town? Uh, I mean... Uh, you know, maybe she's no true crime aficionado like our gems, but it seems like it seems like there's certainly there. I think there must be some level of denial here because, and and maybe that's what it takes. Maybe maybe anybody married to a serial killer has to exercise a certain amount of denial and rationalization, and it will. But we'll talk about we'll talk about more of that later. And. Uh... Well, so Ozzy Todd asked, do we know she was home when he brought home sex workers? What John Ray is stating is that there were swingers that came over. And there is a difference between swingers and, and sex workers. And John Ray explains that during the presser. But that Asa was there during this time when Karen arrived. And... So, so yes. Well, um, to get a little more specific, um, so my my report, I have a you know I have an article here from People Magazine, who you know is a credible source. The article is October nineteenth, twenty twenty three. That was the day of the presser. Christine um, uh, Palaszczuk is the author of this article. She claims in this article that uh, Karen Vergata was a sex worker that she was picked up on the way to the house. And the witness here, the female witness claims that, and this is going to turn out to be important, but the female witness was, she was with her boyfriend at the time. I don't know if they remained together, but her boyfriend was a police detective. She claims that Rex Hewerman participated in sexual activities with the sex worker, Karen Vergata, with the woman who went over, I don't, we don't know her name, and with the police detective. So with the sex worker, the female girlfriend, the male boyfriend, and that Asa also participated in some of those activities. So, so we do know that there was at least Assuming the witness is credible, I don't think the witness would gain anything by disclosing something like this without some credibility, right? I mean, I guess the argument against the credibility here is that she says this occurred around Valentine's Day, 1996. And as a forensic psychologist, I, I can say with a lot of certainty that memory is very fallible, that memory, we know that memory is reconstructive. There's been a lot of experts in my field that have provided testimony debunking or at least challenging witness testimony, especially with memory that's, 
you know, well over 20 years old, 25 plus years old. So I guess you could argue that, that her memory is faulty and that perhaps she doesn't recollect what actually happened. Um, but on the other hand, I think if this was a fairly memorable or salient event to her for whatever reasons, she's more likely to remember it and she's more likely to remember details. The fact that she seems to remember details would speak to the fact that her memory seems reasonably sound. So, so I think that's, that's sort of the argument, the argument that would be made against this witness being valid or accurate is the memory argument. I'm sure that if, if Asa turns out to be a witness here or, or if, or even show some involvement. And, and again, I don't know, I wouldn't, her attorney, by the way, strongly denies that, but, but I'm sure that somebody would raise questions about the memory issue in this particular instance. But to answer Tad's question in short, um, that, that as far as we know, there were, that also knew there were sex workers in the home and she not only knew them, but apparently participated with them. And I think Lauren just lost the link. So I'm going to, I'm going to wait. <laughs> okay. I'm back. Are you, we're having, are we having technical difficulties? We are. <laughs> Okay. And I'll switch right. sides because I know you like being on the other side. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, How stressed out were you when that happened? Sorry. Everyone. I was a little stressed. It's, it's, <laughs> it's always a little stressful to like lose your co-host just like that, to just get ghosted by your co-host. But um, that's okay. We always deal with a lot of technical issues. So no, um, we don't get, we, we, well, maybe we're not always true. Uh, I think this brings us to the question. There have been so many great comments and I think this brings us to the headline. It was your headline and it okay. brings us, uh, do you want to yeah. share the headline of tonight? It's Asa Ellerup, essentially a coercive or elusive marriage. Being collusive. And, yes. And, and one of our first, Patreon commenter said, are you sure you mean elusive? Yes, <laughs> we do. Yeah. Well, let me, let me clarify that. So collusive obviously would imply that she, that she may have had some involvement. I don't know at what level, but uh, I guess at the extreme, maybe at the most extreme side, you, you would see her as being like some version of who was the Jeffrey Epstein person Maxwell Maxwell yeah something like that that she I don't know that maybe she helped him find victims I mean I, I'm not I don't I don't think that's the likely scenario but maybe at one extreme if she is collusive maybe she has some involvement at some level I, I don't know what that is at the moment I mean again she was out of town when she seemed to be out of town when a lot of these murders occurred um you know, I, I should mention though that they did find some of her DNA and her hair at some of the crime scenes. There was her hair was on duct tape, and her DNA was found, I believe, on or around one of the victims' bodies. So, I you know, but I don't. I'm not going to read too much into that. Yeah, I mean, you she, still don't know. He could have done that. It, she, she lived, lived in, in the house. house. She lived in the house, so it's right. hard to ever know. She happened. lived in the home, so I mean, it, it, it's not. It's clearly it's not improbable that a, a strand of hair could end up on some duct tape that he's using. But again, I mean, if we're going to go with this argument that that I mean, so w after this crime first occurred and Rex Hurman was charged, she found an attorney who had a press conference fairly quickly, like within a week where he said she had no involvement. She was shocked. She knew nothing. So that stance, so that would be the other extreme. So being somehow, collu you know, there's some, there, somehow there was collusion would be one extreme. And the other extreme would be the attorney and Asa denying everything and saying that she didn't know anything. I mean, clearly she knew about her husband's lifestyle. She participated in that lifestyle, right? She knew that, 
not just about the swinging, presumably, but about the fact that he was hiring people to participate in these activities. She presumably knew about his dungeon, whatever exactly that is or means. We don't know for sure, but right. So collusive would be on one extreme. When I say elusive, I'm referring to the fact that more of the other extreme that that Rex Hewerman himself would be elusive in the sense that he's the kind of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type scenario where he's hiding everything from her. And he's he's elusive in the marriage in the sense that he's not presenting who he truly is. He's not presenting his sexual deviance, for lack of a better term, that he's not right. He's he's hiding himself. He's elusive in their marriage. He's not showing her who he is, that she knows not. So that's the argument that the lawyer made, that at the presser when, after Rex was arrested and charged, you know, she, the attorney said she didn't know anything, right? So that would be the elusive argument that, that her husband was, had a double life. She didn't know anything about it. So, I, you know, given this latest revelation, that seems to me a bit of a stretch now. Yeah. Many people are bringing up, so I'll just clarify that um, Asa is a foreigner. She is not. Her ancestry is Icelandic, but she was born in New York and is from New York and met Rex Hewerman in New York. So while she is Icelandic, she is not a foreigner. She's, as far as we know, she's a U.S. citizen. She was born in the United States. Yeah. They were married in 1993. There was other questions about Karen happening before they were married. It was after um, their marriage in 1993. Right. The incident this witness is talking about or recalling is from 1996. So it's three years after they were married. Yeah. Yes. So, so but let's, you know, let's start. Can I ask some questions or do sure. you want to share something or should I ask some of our Patreon questions? I, I think I want to, so I would, I would rec for those who haven't watched our first show about Rex Hewerman, I'd recommend people go back and we, we don't have time to rehash all of that, but the, I want to talk about just the main theme of that, which is that this is a guy who's primarily concerned with dominance. So the, the main theme that I kind of wanted to talk about in our first show was that this is someone who is very much invested in being in control of situations and exerting his dominance over other people. And, you know, and the other side of that, by the way, is that there, there seems to be some sadistic quality here that he want, he probably has some interest in humiliating his victims to some degree. So, but the, this theme of, of dominance, I think, is really important to understand with Rex Hewerman because that theme is not just related to his murders or the the serial killing. It's probably also related to his marriage and his workplace and many other parts of his life. And we, in the first show, we talked about people that knew him that said he was super controlling, that he he hung up work projects just, just because he could that he wanted to let you know that he was in charge. So we see this theme over and over. And that's going to be relevant to our discussion in a little bit. So um, so I think right now I just want to say before you ask some questions that we need to understand that he has this real need and desire for dominance. And I and I and I say that in multiple ways that he wanted to be he's a big guy that when he was in a room, he would try to physically dominate the room. He would try to take over the room through his presence. And he would try to dominate psychologically. He would try to control people or he would hang projects up, as I mentioned, that he was, and he would also try to dominate emotionally in some ways by instilling fear in people. So, so I think, I think that's an important motif to begin with and to remember from the previous show. Thank you. Um, Stephanie Budge just shared the link to our first live. Again, thank you to our amazing mods. Thank you for being here, uh, Stephanie and, and Tad and others that I've seen. Um, there, again, is also a full playlist to watch on on our Rex Hurman um, information. Thank on you. This, on this comment here about Asa's attorney made a statement during the latest allegations, 
I, I should mention, I should briefly mention that what that statement was, at least <clears throat> he, he also made a statement to, in the, in the article I just referenced with People Magazine, he made a statement saying essentially that the comments that the witness statements are outrageous, are quote, outrageous and reckless. And then he said, <laughs> as, a, as a podcaster, this is my favorite. So this is the, us as attorney is Bob Macedonio. Yes. Uh, so he said that the, the, the witness's statement is outrageous and reckless, but then he also said, and I'll quote him here, every time you open a paper, turn on the news or listen to the radio, there's some outlandish allegation that's being thrown around by somebody on a podcast. So, <laughs> so here we are, we're on a podcast and, but we're not going to, we're not going to try to make this too outrageous. The problem right, with, we're, we're discussing the problem, the problem with Bob's statement is that these, these witnesses all, and, and this doesn't mean they're accurate, but the witnesses all made sworn signed F statements in affidavits. And that's better than just, calling up the local news channel and saying, Hey, you know, I, I might've remembered something right. That an affidavit gives it more credibility and they're willing to kind of risk their reputations to some degree by doing that. So I think the attorney just happened to overlook that little part, which is a big part, obviously. And, um, and you know, if if we thought the witness statements were outlandish or outrageous or reckless, we we obviously wouldn't be talking about them. I think there's I think there's some credibility here, and also the other part that Bob misses her attorney is that there's multiple witnesses. There's multiple. There's right. at least three witnesses saying that the Hewermans were not only swingers but they engaged purchased sex workers and that this was a part of their lifestyle. So, you know, maybe if it's one witness that has poor memory or mental health problems, that might be questionable, but here you have multiple, you have three and they're all making sworn statements saying that this is true. So, um, so while Bob can say that podcasters are all outlandish, <laughs> um, and I mean, I don't, I don't totally disagree with them, by the way. Like there's, you know. <laughs> I do. Not us. Not us. <laughs> there's, there's probably a few podcasters that are outlandish. Hopefully we don't fall in that category. But, um, but in fairness that, yes, Bob, uh, Bob Macedonio made statements um, right. claiming that, claiming that, Asa, that us is being wrongly targeted here. So that's important to know. Correct. So let's move forward with some questions. Yeah. Let's, yep. let's delve in because we, yep. we, yeah. So Isabel asks on Patreon, anything on coercive control? I have no doubt that she was terrified of him and maybe suffering with some mental health problems herself. And she has a son with learning disabilities. I think that if she had left him, they would have not been safe anywhere. And I have seen a lot of comments here with people asking the same thing. What about coercive control? What about fear? What about her being forced to do these things? Yeah, so that's right. That's a really interesting question. To answer that question, I think I want... So I already talked about his need for dominance. That's, that's important in knowing and answering that question. But the other... The, you know, the other area I want to just mention quickly here, or or maybe not so quickly, but is I want to talk about some research by Teresa Gannon. Teresa Gannon has done a lot of research on female sex offenders. And you might say, well, Asa is not a female sex offender. And yeah, that's true. But uh, I think this is important for understanding the dynamic potentially between Rex Hewerman and Asa in terms of, well, first of all, let me back up for a second, that if, if Rex Hewerman and Asa brought a sex worker into their home who was 16 years old and engaged in any sexual act with that person, that would be a crime, right? That if 
if they engage in any type of sexual relationship together or with other people that wasn't consensual, that would be a crime. So I, and do I think that Rex Hewerman would be capable of bringing a minor into the home to engage in, in sexual acts? Absolutely. The guy had no sexual boundaries whatsoever. And we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but, but I, I think there's, there's a very high risk here that, Asa, I'm not, again, I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying that there's a, there's some probability here that Asa may have engaged in activities that would be considered illegal and might be typical of a female sex offender. Although I don't have any evidence for that, but I'm going to talk about Teresa Gannon's work because it's completely relevant to this scenario. And Teresa Gannon, this is an article she wrote from 2014, where she summarizes some of her research the title of the article is Women Who Sexually Offend Display Three Main Offense Styles, A Reexamination of the Descriptive Model of Female Sexual Offending. This is from 2014. It's in a really respected journal called Sexual Abuse. The model that Teresa Gannon developed, and she's, she has a number of other authors, by the way, so it's not just Teresa, it's, but she's the lead author in many of this work. She's the one who developed the descriptive model of female sexual offending. So Teresa, Teresa says essentially that there's, and, and she's, she's looked at records of female sex offenders. She's interviewed them. She's gone deep on this issue. So her, I think her research is probably the most prominent in this area. But Teresa essentially divides female sex offenders into three different categories. There's the what she calls the explicit dash approach female offender. There's the directed slash avoidant offender, and there's the implicit slash disorganized female sex offender. The explicit dash approach offender is basically a female sex offender. I'm going to, so I'm, I'll read, I'll just read her brief descriptions here so I can, she can do this better than me. So I'm going to give her summary the explicit approach, uh, okay, so this is a quote. This is page 211 from her article, quote, explicit approach women who, act, who actively plan their offending experience significant positive affect about their offending and require literal or no coercion, coercion to offend. Directed avoidant women did not plan their offenses. They experienced significant negative affect associated with their offending and they required extreme and or prolonged coercion to offend. Finally, implicit disorganized women showed very low levels, if any, of planning their offenses. They experienced either positive or negative affect associated with their offending, and they were highly impulsive. So in other words, the explicit approach women, female offenders, were more predatory. They, were more, they, they planned their offenses. They enjoyed committing their sexual offenses. They were quite deliberate about their offenses and there was no coercion. There could have been coercion with victims, but there was no coercion in terms of someone getting them to do something. So the next category, the directed slash avoidant offenders, the, the offenses were not planned. They didn't enjoy the experience. And oftentimes they were abusive relationships and it took a lot of coercion to get them to offend sexually. So why is this relevant? Because I think, I think if you look at Asa, she would definitely, and again, like, so I'm not saying she's a female sex offender, but the question is to me partly is, does she want to, does she choose to engage in this type of lifestyle? Does she choose to engage in sexual acts with, you know, swinger, other swingers and or sex workers? Does she enjoy that? Is it, or is it incongruous to her? Meaning does she, that she doesn't, from an emotional standpoint, she doesn't really get anything out of it. And it, it seems to me pretty clear that, that also would fit this category of the direct slash avoidant female offender in the sense that 
She's in an abusive relationship, probably. I don't know. It could be physically abusive, could be emotional, whatever it is that that Rex Hunerman clearly is a guy that wants domination in all his relationships. And yeah, I can't imagine a marriage with Rex Hewerman that is not abusive. Let's just lay that out. Right. So, so I, so the point is that I think in these types of potentially abusive relationships and in these relationships where there's a lot of coercion, presumably with someone like Rex Hewerman, what happens is that the direct slash avoidant offender is through fear. It's mainly through fear. Fear of being harmed, fear of losing the relationship, fear of losing financial security. It's the same thing you see in domestic violence relationships. So it's it's a fear-based relationship, but it, it's what fear is what drives fear and coercion is what drives the behaviors. And typically, Teresa Gannon talks about this a bit. There's a lot of cognitive distortions. So in order for women to stay in these relationships, there needs to be a certain level of denial. There needs to be a certain level of rationalization. There needs to write that this is, we talked about this a lot in our book club meeting this past week when we talked about abducted in plain sight, that, that, you had a family where the parents essentially allowed their daughter to be kidnapped twice, kidnapped and sexually abused twice. And how did they do that? What allowed them to, to have a known sex offender walk into their home and take their daughter, not once, but twice. And the answer is obviously that there has to be a certain amount of delusion or denial or rationalization that, that, at some level, I think when you when you're in these types of relationships like Asa, um, you know, in order to function, you you need to sort of go along with the program and 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 really have a distorted view of the world. And so, th- I think that's the only way someone like this can really see Rex Hewerman as someone that she wants to stay married to, or or live with. Right. And so I think there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of denial going on here. And, um, but I think the main point I want to make is that it's the coercion. It's the, it's the fact that I think that Rex is planning these activity, sexual activities, these engagements with sex workers. And she's essentially, I don't know if she's, if he's threatening her, but he's bringing her into these activities. Probably I wouldn't say against her will, but she's not fully on board as my guest. He's going along with the program so that she can stay married. And she's probably at some level, very afraid of him. Your mic is off. Next question. We have quite a few to get through. So Um, a Patreon member asks, could Asa have been in a collusive relationship, but without knowing about the murders? I think so. I, I, again, it depends. It, it it depends how deep the collusion was, right? Like, do, do I think that she helped him plan these murders or that she knew about them? I don't know. That's, that's not totally clear, but did she, did she know about his lifestyle? I, that seems pretty clear. So uh, it seems to me that she clearly knew that he was involved with, some of the women that were going missing three miles, you know, five miles from their house, which, <laughs> which, uh, you know, I don't, which is poses a problem. Yeah. But how much did she want to know that? How much, I mean, was she, did, was she totally in denial about that? So when the press reports that there's a victim's body found, you know, several miles from their home and then, 
it's a sex worker or maybe even a sex worker that she remembers from meeting or something. I don't know. Like that doesn't that seems like that might raise questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing I want to point out too, and, and yeah, people could say that this is a PR stunt or she's saying, look, I have nothing to do with this. Use your mute button when you do that, I sweetheart. I <laughs> Helps with <laughs> editing, please. Yeah. It's a quick cough. Yeah. I thought I'd get, get away with a quick cough, but nothing yeah, gets by no. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's The question is, uh, oh, I want to just put out that she did file for divorce right after his arrest. Could that have been a PR stunt? Yeah. Could it have also been her ability to finally divorce someone that she's been wanting to divorce, but did not have the freedom to do so because she was afraid. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. With the guy locked up, what's a better time, what better time to get a divorce and reduce the risk of, of some type of retaliation or anger, right? That, that yeah, that's a great time to get a divorce. I think she's probably just hoping against hope that he stays there, but yeah. 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 Um, all right. Uh, another Patreon member. And again, these are questions that we asked at patreon.com slash hidden to crime. Thank you to our Patreon family for these great questions. Do you have any thoughts about the swinging and how it relates to this case in any way? But I'm specifically thinking this person states his pathology. Is this likely a sexual thing or power? I am unfamiliar with this culture. Um, but let's also throw in that this swinging was also, um, I'll add to this question is also opposite sex swinging or same sex swinging too. Um, Rex Hewerman is married to a woman. Um, there, there, there is a male victim that's been found or, um, or a female depending on if, if if the woman is transgender, she's a, she's a female, but, um, that was a unique part of this too. Not just the swinging, but same sex swinging as well. Well, they haven't, right. They haven't tied that particular victim to Rex Hewerman. Well, he's, yeah, he's, well, they've implied it. Yeah, they've implied it, but I, they've implied they, it with the Google searches and who yeah. this person is. He, he's certainly he's certainly on everyone's radar, including police. So he hasn't I, charged him yet. I think the 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 so the 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 swinging piece that just that we just learned a few days ago makes this a little more interesting in the sense that I think I see the swinging as part of a larger constellation of potential pathology in the sense that if you now look at let's call it as sexual deviance. Cause and what I mean by that is sexual activities that aren't either they're not consensual or they're illegal in some sense. So, so if you look at his sexual interests, for example, so one of the things we learned a couple of months ago when he was arrested is that some of his internet searches were released and we learned that, he had thousands of searches for, I'm going to try to use the right term here. Let's call it minor exploitative material that he was, he was, he was looking at material that would normally land someone in jail or prison for quite a bit of time. And I don't know. So I don't know if he possessed this material, I'm talking about a type of, of pornography here, obviously. I don't know if he had this on his computer, but it certainly if you look at if you look at his history of hundreds and by some 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 people have claimed that there were thousands of searches for inappropriate minor material on the internet. And some of those, some of those searches were just, but the, the, his search terms were mind boggling. So I don't, I don't think you look for this type of material thousands of times without having some prurient, prurient interest in it, right? That 
So it seems to me that there's, for whatever reasons, there's, there might be some attraction to children and which it would, it could be, you know, it could be just looking at the material or it could be something more nefarious, like actually engaging in activities that he shouldn't be engaged in with children. I, I don't know, but like the, if you look at those searches, it's pretty disturbing. And so, so I think the, the combination of his interest in that material involving minors, and now we're learning for, that he's, he had, for example, the detective that went to his house that night, he had apparently had a sexual interest in him. He had a sexual interest in the sex worker that was there. He had a sexual interest in the detective's girlfriend. He he appears to have a sexual interest in children. He that that I think what's going on here is that his sexual deviance really doesn't know a lot of boundaries. That you know the the further out you expand this net, I think the more troubling this becomes in the sense that it seems to me like, so in, in, in the world, <laughs> in the world I work in, and I I've done a lot of groups with sex offenders. We, we call these types of offenders, crossover offenders, or crossover sexual offenders in the sense that, that I know this is going to sound strange to a lot of people, but in my groups, you know, oftentimes because of limited resources and time, you know, I would have to put different types of offenders together. So I might I might put together a someone who had offended against minors with someone who had engaged in sexual assault. And it was, you know, one of the interesting dynamics about groups like that is that the the offenders would all kind of they would <laughs> they would all kind of dispute whether they belonged in a group with someone who would say engaged in uh activities with minors and they would fight that and say, well, I, I can't believe I'm in a room with someone who did something to a minor. I mean, never mind that this guy committed sexual assault, right? That they, like they, that, but the point is that many sex offenders have kind of a preference or an MO and that they, that people who commit sexual assault don't necessarily have an interest in minors, for example. But if you, so if you look at Hewerman, that's not true that he crosses all boundaries, right? He's a crossover offender in the sense that he transgresses all normal boundaries, that he has an interest in children. He has an interest in men, women, maybe animals. I don't know. Like it does, there doesn't seem to be any limits to what he's, to his sexual interests and deviance. And, and so I think that that starts telling us a lot about him in the sense that he's um, that there's something, I don't know. There's something deeply antisocial about just sh having this kind of sexual impulsivity and this inability to curtail any of his sexual impulses and to be attracted to everything and anything. And I think that at the very least, that means his risk his risk for future sex crimes is extremely high. And when you, when you put that together with his propensity towards violence, you're talking about someone that, you know, you're talking about the end result of that is what we see. You're talking about a sexual serial killer, a sexually sadistic serial killer. And so part of that is this, the swinging fits into that picture in the sense that there's absolutely no boundaries around any sexual activity with this guy. So the dominance, the lack of sexual boundaries, kind of the antisocial tendencies, the hist the violence that he's showing us, all of that, all of that starts helping us get a better picture of this guy and what he's capable of and what he's done. You know, how, how, if somebody says, how do you get to sadistic sexual serial killing? Well, that, this is a good way to do that. You know, interestingly enough, a lot of, a lot of serial killers, sexual serial killers, <clears throat> have much they have much better boundaries around 
their sexual impulses than Rex Hewerman. So um, in, in many ways, this guy's risk and his pathology are extremely troublesome. Right. Next question. Um, why does society seem to want to blame women for everything? I was married to an alcoholic. Friends and family pressured me to make him stop. From the get-go, in this case, it seems like a lot of folks expected Asa to not only know what was going on, but to stop it. It's maddening to me. Well, I, I think our, the short answer is that we we didn't want to bring Asa into this until we had to. So <laughs> two days ago when people started implicating her in some of the activities going on, the sexual activities going on at the human home, I think we had no choice but to to revisit the case. So but but I I I agree that I think there is there is this tendency maybe to to blame the partner and to some degree. And I guess the reason is that when you have somebody as outrageous as Rex Hewerman and somebody that's, that it's doing such heinous things and it, it becomes so hard to digest and understand it's, it's easier to blame the people associated with them and around him, especially a spouse, I think, right. That we want to, we want to kind of expand the net to feel like, perhaps we have a better explanation or we want to bring in more people into the tent to make us feel like perhaps the culpability should, should extend beyond the actual serial killer. And, and I, so I think in this case, because Rex Hewerman is so extreme and he's so violent and, and in many ways he's so, you know, he, he creates such fear that I think that one way to really kind of appease that fear or to allay that fear is to, is to point the finger at other people. So uh, Asa would be a natural target of the finger pointing, you know, unfortunately for her though, if these witnesses are credible, the finger pointing might have some validity. So it's not that we want to talk about her. I think that we were kind of, you know, again, if this is we, we need to talk about her, we need to talk yeah. about her because she's being talked about and we want to be a part of the conversation and an important part of the conversation. Um, Rachel Meadows asks, given the new information on Rex's sexual relations with a man. Oh, well, maybe we already covered this. Okay. I jumped the gun. How likely okay. is um, a, the male body found likely one of the victims and B, is it unusual to break away from his type MO of his victim profile or are there perhaps even more male victims? Thanks. Well, we, we first did of cover all, a we, bit of that. So we don't, we don't know. So uh, let me, let me just, so I haven't, we answered some of that, but I think in broad terms, the, the press conference a couple of days ago really opened the door for me to ask the question, are there more victims here? And I, I don't mean just the, the the bodies that were found at Gilgo Beach or in Long Island, but I mean, like, are there more victims here in terms of sex crimes, sexual assaults, right? The, are there more victims broadly defined that are still alive? And the answer is absolutely. I think that this is someone who's who's probably victimized way more people than we're aware of at the moment, and that that those could be children. They could be anyone, right? And at the very least, I would expect, based on his internet searches, I would expect them to find exploitative minor material on his computer. And depending on how much they find, that that alone could put them away for years, for sure. So uh, I think one of the most interesting elements of the press conference and the new information we've learned is not just Asa and what she knew and whether she was collusive, but the fact that this really, I think, shows us more about who Rex Hewerman is. And it really, to me, it indicates that there's probably way more victims that we don't know about who may come forward. They may not. I don't know. They're probably very afraid. But um, I think clearly the, 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 victim, the three victims that have been identified and linked to him are just the beginning. 
Amen to that. I agree. I so agree. The three victims that have been linked to him that he has been charged with right. is just the beginning. You're scratching the surface. Correct. Scratching the surface. I mean, and, and I don't know, it could be anything from sexual harassment at work to who knows, possession of minor material. I, there's so much here that he could be, <laughs> he could be charged with. Um, it'll be interesting to see where, what the DA picks up and what evidence they have and where they go with this case. I think it, at the very least, if of course they're going to, they're going to try him for murder and it seems like they have a pretty good case, but if they need more, they certainly probably can find it. Uh, the last Patreon question comes from Debbie Biggs and Debbie, thank you so much for your support tonight. We appreciate that and saw that. She asks, why would someone have such a break between killings? Do you think there is likely more victims and that they just haven't been tied to Rex? But, but her main question I think is a really interesting one. Why would someone have such a break between killings? Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know if we know the timeline here. I think it seems like a lot of these bodies were found along, you know, around the same time, but we don't know when they were deceased, right? We don't know. We don't, <clears throat> I think the timeline of victims here is really uncertain. It could go all the way back to the nineties or late nineties. And, um, they're, they're, you know, again, it seems like, um, there's probably way more victims than we're aware of, but, a lot of times I think serial killers will take breaks because they're afraid of being caught or they want to reevaluate the situation or right. That there there's, I can't imagine that Rex Huberman would have a lot of fear of being caught because he's so arrogant, but there could be a lot of reasons why, why a serial killer may stop for a bit and then come back to it or, or maybe not come back to it for a while. Okay. Yeah, as Blonde Granny states, I think he's responsible for all of the bodies at Gilgo Beach. It's a matter of time to find all of the evidence. Um, other people saying, with all the commonalities among his victims, many women would not want to admit to being associated with Rex. Um, someone else mentioned that the interview I did, that was with Nikki Brass, someone who went on a date with Rex Huerman. You can also find her in our playlist. Uh, Megan Brain says he told the lady Lauren interviewed there were like 10 or 11 victims, but that was, I don't even think the last of them. So, and, and they only really found one location for victims so far. I think that police know, and they're slowly, he's behind bars. He has three right. charges. Police are being slow. They're being methodical. They have the time because he is behind bars at this moment, charged with three. I think it's just a matter of time. And and you only need one. You only need one conviction to put him away the rest of his life. So I, I think they're from a risk management standpoint. I think they feel like the community's safe. But in terms of if we think about a lot of his crimes in terms of justice or getting justice, then that's a different issue. My guess is there's so many victims out there. But I, I think so. I, but I think the justice piece is important too. If you think of somebody like Israel Keys, Israel Keys was only really linked to a few victims. I mean, he he took his life before justice could be served, unfortunately. But Israel Keys for sure had so many victims that have not been identified and. And so I think there, there, there's a, it's important to make a distinction between they don't – I think law enforcement recognizes that to protect the community, they don't need to find a lot more victims. But in terms of serving justice, they probably need to find more victims. So – or at least in terms of helping us, helping the community feel better or feel some greater sense of justice, um, presumably that's – that's they'll keep going and, and – hopefully connect more of these crimes to Rex Huerman. Yes. I want to give a uh, big shout out to Ivana Tinkle because funny story. 
I was in Salt Lake City this last week and I met the real Ivana Tinkle. And here I thought she was always trying to get me to say Ivana Tinkle, but she told me the story about why that's her name. Um, it does have to do with the Simpsons. And it was so fun to meet her. I was actually, I walked into a beautiful gift store. I, I won't share this name. I'll keep, I'll keep you private. If you want to share it, Ivana, you can in comments, but I'll, I'll keep your private information private. But we looked around this beautiful store in Salt Lake City. And as we were leaving, I heard, are you Lauren? And she introduced, she said, I'm Ivana Tinkle. I gave her a big hug. So so thank you for being here, Ivana. I was able to meet her husband. It was wonderful. Um, Elisa, thank you, too, so much for your support tonight. Yes. And now I will say Ivana Tinkle anytime. <laughs> now I know who she is. Oh. Um, uh, I know we need to run tonight. And I just want to say this. We are getting so many incredible questions. Um, we do have to run. So we will soon, um, either Saturday or maybe we'll even do a midweek live. If we have time, we will, uh, give here and here it is. That's their, their, the booze teak. They had beautiful glassware and mixers and just, it was, it was really neat. It's in Salt Lake city, downtown Salt Lake. I, I was in there with our son. So, um, so anyway, with all the questions coming down, I think we should do this because this episode is not over. It's far from over. I can already tell. Leave your questions in comments um, at the end of this live stream. The, the comments will pop up to leave questions. And um, thank you. Thank you so much, True Cal Girl. And then um, we will do another live with Q&As all of your Q and A. So, so leave your questions in comments. It's clear this episode is not over. The incredible questions coming down. I love our community. I love our gems because I want to know, I have so many of the same questions for Dr. John. So put those in comments and we will either midweek or next Saturday continue this episode. So thank you. Thank you. Um, to those again, that have been following our day bell footage, our Tim Ballard footage, our Jody Hildebrandt footage, we connected the dots this last week. I traveled to Salt Lake City to be with Megan Connor, Lori Ballow Daybell's cousin, and Mindy Caldwell. She's also a friend of the program. And John DeLynn, the host of Mormon Stories. And um, I feel a weight lifted, honestly. It's been something I've been looking into for two years. And we shared it all there. Uh, you can find the stream here or over on Mormon Stories. Uh, Two-part episode. Um, check it out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for our new Patreons. Thank you for the wonderful questions we had tonight. And again, this is not over. So please, again, leave your questions in comments. Um, we'll try to scroll the live stream as well, but it does help John and I if we can just sit down um, and just go through the comments, um, whatever you would like to ask about this. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anything else, Dr. John? Um, nope. I think we're, I think, I think we're done for tonight. Yeah. Again, please check out our LISC Rex Hewerman playlist. This is uh, one of many. So a lot of the questions you've been asking tonight too, um, we've discussed um, some interesting things, including Rex's past and his childhood and upbringing. For those asking if this is nature versus nurture, Always a great question for Hidden True Crime, and we have answered a bit of that. Um, please, please like and subscribe. Um, subscribing to our YouTube channel is an incredible support. It allows us to grow. It allows us to be seen. It allows us to get the interviews you guys want to see. Um, when people see we have many subscribers, they're willing to talk to us as I get out there, uh, boots on the ground journalism, uh, talking to many people. Please... Um, like this video so we can share our knowledge and Dr. John's knowledge specifically. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to our mods. And yeah, thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night.